I'd like to thank our sponsors for the Nutshells, um, the Hegner Family Foundation, and as well as North Central Fair. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to bring you these discussions for free. So thank you so much um, to them, and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I really appreciate it, and I'd really like to thank Dan, um, Dan Shepard, for being with us tonight. Dan is um, from Missouri, uh, from Shepherd Farms, and um, I'm really excited to hear what he's going to be presenting um, and seeing some really great pictures. Well, should we get started, Dan? Sure. We okay. can do that. All right. Well, I will, I'll let you introduce yourself. I don't want to step on your toes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fine. Doesn't make any difference to me. We can start it. That's that's not a problem. I guess everybody's logged in and ready to go. So. Yeah, I think so. And people might be joining us, um, and they might be popping in in and out um, depending on their connections or their schedules. Um, okay. All right. Well, I, they wanted me to talk about large-scale alley cropping uh, with pecans and. Uh, First, I uh, welcome you a little bit to, to Shepherd Farms. We're located in Clifton Hill, Missouri, and for that, we're about 90 miles south of the Iowa border and about 100 air miles due east of Kansas City. We're in the uh, in the river bottoms. We're in the uh, tributaries of the Missouri River. Um, sorry, but we don't have any rocks on the farm. That's what we bring in, so uh, this is a rock. We run about 4,000 acres total on the farm. Of that, uh, 3, 300 acres are in pecans, and about 200 acres of those are in production. The other 100 are anywhere from 10 years to just a few years to being in production, so uh, we're, uh, we're starting out on that. Another thing is we, uh, we process all our own pecans, and we market all our own pecans here on the farm. We're located on a major U.S. highway, U.S. Highway 24, and uh, so we're highly visible and stuff, and we do have an on-farm store, so we can pretty well take it from, uh, you know, from pollination all the way through uh, through uh, consumption, you might say. My wife, Jan, along with one employee, we take care of the place, and then we hire a couple of part-time employees during harvest season. Uh, they want me to talk about alley cropping with pecans. And that's really kind of funny because we just used to call it farming between the pecan trees for years. That's what we did. And then they came along with alternative agriculture, and then they've come up with agroforestry. But still to us, it's still just farming between the pecan trees is what we were doing all those years and stuff. Here's a few of our 5,000 trees on the farm. Uh, we planted our first orchards, believe it or not, in 1971. Uh, we planted a main orchard in 1981. So... We've had uh, the uh, uh, been doing it for quite a few years and stuff, and we have uh, uh, matured on that sort of thing. It uh, it gets cold here. Uh, the map says we're uh, you know zone six, but I really feel we're more of a solid uh, zone five. We're in a pretty heavy frost pocket here. Uh, you know, it gets cold. I think last one of the coldest we had was either 13 below, and the year before that was 17 below. So. And that's not wind chill either, that's just direct temperature. And then down the bottom to where it really gets colder, if it gets still, we can get five degrees colder even down there. So uh, we're just to feel about, about as far north as we can raise a, raise a pecan successfully year after year. Um, here's a picture of our, our oldest trees. Um, they're an experimental orchard. My father loved to go around and find, try to find that perfect pecan that was wherever. And... Uh, we had about 15 acres that we planted in '71, and, and on some uh, outside the levee, flooded flood ground and stuff. And we put those there to, to decide, try to find a, a good northern variety, uh, you know, a local pecan that would work out for us fairly fine. Because there's uh, so many different things, we ended up with about 45 different varieties grafted down there. Um, some known varieties, a lot of unknown varieties that were for local. It was nice to have them all in one area in one spot where the you know the same temperature, the same land, soil, fertility, everything was all the same, so we could take care of that. Got what we wanted, so it worked out pretty well for us on that. We didn't really find exactly what we wanted, but uh, we made some 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 pretty good decisions on that. Uh, really, like I said, mainly we were farming between the pecan trees. We uh, 
as the trees got older and stuff, we we started out, you know, there's a 12 row corn planter, but we're only using eight rows of it back years ago, and uh, we could uh, do pretty well commercial stuff. And then back then, the the fertilizer and the weed control for the crops uh, really didn't affect the pecan trees at all whatsoever. Um, matter of fact, it was really good because we got free fer- fertility and fertilizer out there. We didn't have to fertilize our trees. And then <clears throat> getting double duty out, then then also the weed control like the atrazine and the, and that sort of stuff uh, worked well for um, for helping hold down some of the weeds in our rows. Uh, like I say, we raised corn, uh, which uh, over the years worked out pretty well. But sooner than later, we finally got down about six rows. We raised with quite a few soybeans also. And back then, our equipment was quite a bit smaller and stuff. Instead of the 35 and 40 foot heads that everybody runs now, we can uh, run and run up and down the rows with a with a fairly small combine. Our main wheat is what we planted was wheat. Um, we worked real well with our agroforestry back years ago, uh, and it also worked well is that we could plant one side pretty well right up next to trees, as you can see on this, and maybe I can take my point if you can see that, uh, fairly close to it, and then gave us a, a, a path down here where we could go and take a, you know, uh, take care of some insect problems or, or weed problems or some pruning problems or whatever else we needed to do. We could get down there while the wheat was still growing or not ruin our crop. We'd also let us uh, do internal drainage and, and drainage on the on the fields and stuff because when we were farming in the same direction all the time, it, it kind of messes the drainage up on those on those on those flat fields and stuff. So that helped out uh, a tremendous amount on that. Uh, so uh, wheat was a was a main player for us also. We finally decided it was, the trees had gotten big enough, and, and our agroforestry was was changing, so we decided it was about time to seed it down to grass, and um, that way we could take care of the trees and then do something else with it, uh, maybe like put up some hay or this, that, and the other. We decided to plant bluegrass in our orchard. Uh, the reason for bluegrass is is that it uh, can stand uh, wetness uh, fairly well. It doesn't tend to dry out, drown out. It also uh, makes it an excellent uh, mat out there to and, and to harvest pecans on, and uh, easy to pick up. It's not clumpy or anything like that. It, it's it's really uh, really nice to harvest pecans on. And number three thing is is when it gets dry, and this because we don't have irrigation in our part of the country, um, it worked out real well for um, turning uh, you know not not taking any moisture away from from the pecan trees. Is it uh, shallow rooted, and when it gets dry, it turns brown, and the pecan trees can stay green and, and all that. So the, that's really why we went to, to bluegrass instead of some of the other grasses we did. From there, we got in the hay business. Um, started cutting a lot of hay, and you take 200 acres of that, and, and of that, you're probably mowing, uh, you know, 100, 165 of it, and that produced a lot of hay. Uh, the uh, fertility was fairly well, was, uh, keeping up on those trees fairly well. We uh, put a lot of it up as dry hay, and uh, we had a barn here on the high, on the farm. We could we could store big round bales in. We also sold quite a bit, and uh, that was fine. But then as the trees got larger and tend to shade more, it uh, got harder and harder to put up dry hay. And also uh, put it up early was what we needed to because bluegrass comes on a lot earlier. We need to really cut bluegrass hay around the 15th of May. Uh, we uh, decided that uh, uh, you know we had we had to go with some some different type of hay with which was baleage, and we would bale these small bales about four feet in diameter, <clears throat> but they weigh about uh, 1,800 2,000 pounds a piece because they're around about 45 percent moisture. It was really great. The stuff, so you know, uh, fed well. This that, and the other. The problem with it is, is you really can't sell that because the weight. You really can't haul it away. And, you know, just to, to to move it, of, you know, 50 miles or or anything because just a very short distance because of the because the stuff weighs so much. So um, we decided we had to, to use it ourselves, which worked out pretty good. Um, we had a fairly large herd of, of American bison. Or the buffalo and uh, on a farm, and 
And uh, that uh, cutting that for hay freed up uh, some other hill ground and stuff that we're using for pasture and hay, and pretty well left it up for for pasture. And uh, we were running about uh, about 200 mother cows of, of buffalo, and uh, market them that way. Also, we uh, uh, fed the baywitch to them. We also fed the baywitch to beef cows. Uh, we got into kind of the beef cow business too. We had some extra forage also for this baywitch, and we would buy uh, in the fall and in winter. Water buyers go out and buy thin, older cows, which would be uh, as long as they, you know, had some teeth in their head, you know, in the short and solids or whatever. But they'd be thin cows that, that may have not had the best groceries in the world or kind of mismanaged, and we could buy those for about thirty cents a pound, and we'd bring them home and. And doctor them and pour them and worm them and put new ear tags in them and get them looking all the same. And then we'd start feeding them that baywage. And that was the really nice thing is feeding that bluegrass that came out of those orchards uh, to beef cows. We could take a 700, 750 beef cow, pound beef cow, and then by, oh, uh, June, when normally we would we'd go ahead and take them to market, uh, they'd be wearing anywhere from 1250 to 1400 pounds. And then they'd bring 60 cents a pound. The main reason was is because in June, uh, the hamburger market's pretty big. Everybody wanting hamburger for their cookouts and that sort of thing. And there's not a whole lot of cattle coming to the market, especially uh, hamburger-type cattle. And also a lot of those would also go up in, in, in a grade or two and make what they call kind of a, a patio steak or a, a bonanza steakhouse sort of steak and stuff that comes out of those older animals. But it... Uh, it worked out uh, out real well for us, uh, you know, to do that. One thing we we did not do is we never grazed our orchards. Um, like I say, I'm on a U.S. highway, and the orchards are too. Uh, we like to have a pretty pretty decent fence on the highway to keep them, <coughs> any animals from getting out. And a lot of those pecan orchards are somewhat in a floodplain; it can flood, so that didn't work out that well. Also, I have problems with manure on on nuts, on pecans, it's uh, kind of like super glue, it just doesn't come off and I have, I uh, just, don't, just don't like to do that, I'd rather harvest it instead of having animals. Also the fencing, we could, um, what I want to say, maybe uh, rotational graze, but that's a lot of fences and we have to get down the orchard all the time and that's a lot of fence moving stuff, it was just easier to, to do it as baywitch and, and not graze the orchards, I know some people uh, like to, but uh, uh, different sized trees and stuff going through there. You'd have to protect all those trees to keep them from rubbing on them. And I know the buffalo would definitely rub on them if we had the buffalo over there. So that's one of those things. Um, people sometimes ask me how we uh, we got our pecan orchard started. That 180 acres, we uh, 200 acres really over there. We planted nuts. Uh, we planted about 10,000. We had about 10,000 flags out there. And instead of planting uh, trees, bare root trees, or, or uh, containerized trees, which would be very expensive, uh, we found out to plant a nut, and we got about 98% take on that. We'd plant two nuts, and 98% of the places, uh, you know, at least had at least one, and most of the places had two. Especially if we could go and, and, and plant one that's already starting to sprout. As you can see this, I think a pointer right here, that you can see the little sprout already coming out on that pecan. You plant him with that with that going down, and and you could pretty well guarantee you have a nut there. So well, that worked. Uh, we uh, we went with 40 foot spacings when we planted our orchard, and the reason we did that is because that's what fertilizer spreaders spread back then. And uh, here we were spreading in, in the spring and stuff, and uh, we're putting on about uh, 60 units of nitrogen in the spring, and then. We also uh, fall fertilize also with about another 60 pounds of nitrogen and then uh, 60 units. Then we had on some P and K as needed, and we were cutting hay and stuff. We would add P and K every year. Um, normally, this the potash is what we all we add now if we're not taking the hay off <coughs> if it's uh, matured. Uh, we put on the N P and K in the fall mainly all that because we got a lot more fertilizer has to be put on, and that way the Ag people that have the um, fertilizer we buy from, it's easier for them to, to, to deliver to me in the fall than it is in springtime when they're really super busy. So that's one of those things. Um, all our pecans trees are in rows, and uh, each row has a 
uh, you know, uh, this, all the trees in the row are the same variety, and we uh, we number each row with a, a number, also with the name of the variety it is. Here's a row of shepherds. I had a buddy of mine that uh, ran a uh, built um, dashboards for Dodge pickup trucks, and this was a stamp out of it. It's a galvanized piece of metal. And uh, drill a hole in it. We nail a nail on the tree and write the variety on there in the row number. We use a uh, wax pencil, a China marking pencil, which works great for tags. Uh, I've got tags been on trees for 35 years and uh, have never been rewrote over, and you can still read them to this day. So, uh, believe it or not, it, that that wax pencil will stay on. But you need to take the oil off the uh, off the tags if there's a little little bit of oil in there. Like I say, each uh, each row has the same uh, variety in there, so we harvest by variety. It sure makes it a lot easier when we're cleaning and also processing here to do one for separate varieties instead of a big mix of them. Um, we uh, we did have a few heart nuts and stuff. We did have about 10 acres at one time that we, we agroforestry through, so we really quickly won all pecans. Uh, we had a really hard drought one late summer and fall, and then uh, we had an early spring and and everything leafed out great and then we had that easter freeze and a uh, cold winter and i think out of 10 acres of of, hick of um, excuse me heart nuts they've got seven trees left here's a couple of them uh never really figured out how to make any money off of them but uh, i got a few left just to get them off of and you can see the the freeze damage in those trees where they've come back out and stuff but uh one of those things uh we raised a lot of hickons my father Loved hickons and uh, those uh, kind of gone by the wayside on the, on those also as different ones, but uh, uh, we had a lot of hickons in the pecan orchard along with black walnuts. Uh, we removed those. We also removed some trees that uh, got scab varieties and stuff, and you could see the the black dots on the on the nuts themselves. Sometimes it's so bad to turn them. Completely black, and then there's 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 no value to those nuts whatsoever. So we tend to go ahead and take those off and uh, and get rid of those. Um, when we decide to remove trees, we uh, we mark them, and I call it my God paint. I go down there in the orchard and play God, and we uh, we don't really like to have a tree touch another pecan tree. So when they start to get big and start crowding out, it's okay. You got a problem, and you got a problem. So, but you don't. So we're going to take you out. So either we put a orange tape around them, or, or mainly just take a, a some kind of paint that you can buy at the oh, home improvement center that they mis mis labeled or mis mixed and pretty good paint. Just dab with some paint on there. It doesn't make any difference what it is. It works out pretty well. Here we are removing trees. Um, this is a, a bunch of. Uh, Hickon trees we took out of this orchard, uh, this line here. Like I said, my dad loved hickons, uh, and he thought it was you know the greatest nut in the world. But he grew up eating hickory nuts. I personally did not. I uh, didn't care that much for him. I finally he wanted a bunch more grafts. I told him, look, Dad, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to graft anymore. By the time these things all come in production, you all be dead, and and that's pretty well about what happened. So as my dad passed away, I went ahead and took these uh, hickon trees out of the orchard. They just didn't work very well because of oh um, difference in, in in spraying, difference in harvesting. Uh, they get mixed in with the other pecans. It was a lot of handwork to get those things sorted out. So we just and then really hard to crack them with a really hard shell on them. But it was a good thing to us because it was um, it was really nice. Uh, we could take those down and the trees were still small enough. They were eight inches at breast height or smaller. And we could we could cut them off the ground level and we'd let them sprout back up and stuff. We could do that. Um, some people ask, well, what did you do with all those trees that you cut down and stuff? Man, we just piled them up and burned them. I had a lot of people want to come and cut firewood and smoking wood and that kind of stuff. But insurance reasons and stuff, uh, to have people, strangers out there walking around on your farm with a chainsaw in their hand, probably not the best thing to have in the world and out there in the country for us. So uh, we kind of limited that. On those uh, trees we cut off, we'd get a sprouts that come up and let them grow for a year. We'd come back the following spring after a year and pick one sprout, and we would graft it to a known, another known variety that we wanted. And you got to remember that um, you know we'd get about a 95% take on those grafts because it, it worked out really well because it had that big, huge root system pushing that little bitty stalk. 
Uh, we left uh, uh, normally around the trees. We'd you know cut the one sprout back, graft it, but then we'd let the other sprouts come back up around each year until the tree got to a certain diameter that the deer wouldn't run it. And we found out if you leave it brushy around the base of those trees and stuff, up to you know up to three or four feet tall, the deer don't like to. Those bucks don't like to rub on them, so. Uh, we would do that as far as putting protectors around them. It would be way too many we could ever get that done. As you can see this one, uh, maybe the pointer here, you can see the the grafting where it's painted white. And, you know, we got a good five or six foot growth on that grafting and on that graft in just one year and stuff. And also the nice thing about it is it gets me in production. Here's a tree that was cut off five years ago, come back up, sprouted and regrowed. And he's now pretty well in production. We're getting nuts off those things. and. Um, you know, it's five years uh, getting a harvest production instead of waiting for 15, which makes it pretty nice with cutting 10 years off of that instead of planting another tree and stuff. So it makes a deal. You can see also there where we painted on where the graft is. So when we go down and prune and this, that, and the other, we know that tree's grafted and also where the graft is so we can prune from there. So it gets us in production, works out real well. <clears throat> Some people say, well, you know, we got, you know, what kind of, Farmers do you have out there and stuff that they really work on the macans? Um, raccoons, uh, you know, they eat a lot, I guess. Um, I noticed last year we got about a half mile of highway frontage that the pecan orchards are on, and uh, the highway department comes along on Friday mornings and picks up all the road kills, I guess, and uh, it was clean. And then the following Monday morning, I drove over to the orchard about the time that all the pecans were starting to fall. And at a half mile, there was 23 roadkill coons alongside the road there along my orchard. And they had to cross a railroad track and a U.S. highway, so I just kind of wondered on how many, you know, did get over there and didn't get hit on the highway. I'm definitely not over there at midnight at night looking and seeing what uh, what's over there eating, but I guess maybe I should. But uh, one of those things, uh, squirrels, of course, squirrels give a lot of people tremendous amounts of problems. Uh, they don't really bother me too bad. Uh, I've got just one small area where they come across from a neighbor onto me. We keep the orchards uh, mowed up uh, like a park, and uh, the hawks and owls work on those uh, on those squirrels pretty hot and heavy, and also not have any older trees out there and have any uh, hollow places or knot holes where they could get into. Um, our, uh, our major problem is crows. Uh, you know, on a good day, we'll lose a 1,000 pounds of pecans a day to crows. You get, you know, Seven, eight hundred thousand, fifteen hundred crows in an orchard. They can eat a lot of pecans and, and destroy a lot of pecans and peck holes in a lot of pecans and haul them off and drop them and come back and get another one to set another. Um, luckily, I have a gentleman that loves to shoot and hunt crows, and from Kansas City he comes out, you know, a number of times and and does fairly well. Uh, uh, gets a pretty good amount and also. Uh, he uh, he educates him so he gets that. He can see that crow's got a pecan in his mouth, uh, you know, and when he shoot, when he when he when he hunted him. So it's uh, you know, one of those one of those things we do. We um, we have permission to shoot year round on those. There is a season for crows. Supposedly it's the uh, national bird of Mexico, so that's why uh, they even U.S. Fish and Wildlife had to put a hunting season on. I think Mexico was complaining that uh, they weren't getting many crows migrating back down to Mexico. So anyway, but that's our, you know, kind of our major problems that we have with with those. Um, like I say, removing any now, our trees have gotten so big that we can't really compensate them anymore. So we remove them with my uh, my renter's traco. I don't do the the row crop farm on the farm. I have a a fellow that uh, that uh, farms pretty big, and he's got a couple of these tracos, and uh, he can pull a tree out in about five minutes, and with really no dirt on the root system whatsoever. And we drag them up and and. Uh, He's always in a hurry. My Photoshop, the fellow showed Photoshop this for me, but uh, stack out with thing if he could have two at one time, pretty going pretty good. Uh, another reason we thin is we like to have at least 50% of the sun hitting the ground around noon, and because of that, uh, that's why we take a lot out. This is about where we like to have the orchard looking, uh, get plenty of air movement, plenty of sun, and uh, that sort of deal. And the main reason is to have a little nutlet start like that that will be coming out here within the next week so we can have pretty nice pecans come fall and, and harvest. And we harvest, we, uh, we shake the trees. With a, with a pecan shaker, it just really vibrates the trees. 
and uh, when they're uh, when they're ready to come down, within about two seconds, we hook on the tree and and uh, all the nuts fall on the ground, and we can do about one every thirty seconds if you're if we're moving pretty fast. We uh, have uh, mechanical harvesters to harvest our pecans. Um, we average we try to average about a thousand pounds of nuts per acre. And these harvesters get about 99% of the nuts. They really don't leave any nut on the ground to speak of. If we have people come and hand pick and stuff, um, you know, about the best hand pickers only get about 70% of the nuts. So, uh, you know, as far as having people coming out and hand harvest and this, that, and the thing, and making a deal out of it, my insurance company really has a hard time with that, uh, with liability. Uh, you don't realize large farms have a hard time uh, with liability. You know, we, we were putting out bids for liability, and one insurance company wouldn't cover us because we had Buffalo, and we had more insurance companies that wouldn't cover us because of uh, we had the trees, and they thought it was a you know a nuisance out there that was uh, uh, liable us open to a lot of liability. So, <clears throat> but uh, you know, there was enough of them that uh, thought that we did get some. We do have liability insurance. <laughs> uh, anyway, we uh, we plant a lot of different varieties, but. Uh, not a tremendous amount, but, but good varieties. You know, we, we plant a lot of uh, Pawnee pecans, which is a, what I call the, the northern paper shell that will grow up here. And it's a fairly thin shell. Matter of fact, uh, shaking the other, last fall and, and uh, shaking a Pawnee and looked, and the, the Pawnee nut fell on the plastic hood of the tractor, and that thing cracked. I said, doggone. I said, it's pretty thin shell. Pretty a little hard to harvest because they are such a thin shell, but they're a big nut. Uh, we get a premium for them. They shell out real nice. We sell them whole nuts to a lot of people for hand crackers. That's sort of thing you put in your hand and crack them real easy. I uh, don't really have a lot of problems with Pawnee as far as scabs. Some people do. We do not have uh, the scab problem stuff. We're grafting a lot of Kanza now, or Kanza. comes out of southeast Kansas. A pretty nice nut. It's a half major. It's fairly round, but it's got a, a beautiful uh, beautiful uh, nut meat, uh, color's good, uh, everything looks pretty great on that. It's scab resistant, we don't see any scab on it, so it, uh, it's one of our major grafting, we're grafting. We graft the shepherd variety. Um, my father bought a tree over uh, by Brunswick, Missouri, over about 25 miles west of here. We actually bought a tree and it's recorded indeed that, that we own a tree over there somewhere. We call it the shepherd variety, it's, it's a northern variety. It uh, doesn't get scab, and scab resistant, and, and uh, very cold hardy. If you were wanting to plant something or graft something, you know, for the northern parts of the country, I would definitely definitely look at Shepherd. It's a pretty good producer year round. It's uh, it produces this a nice, you know, full crop about every year. I don't have a lot of problem with that. It shells out real nice, and the shell's thick enough that it it, it goes through harvest, mechanical harvest, without. Getting getting broken. It's a, it's a really nice nut. We uh, one of my favorite nuts. Probably the only problem is it's a little not quite as precocious as some of the others. It takes a few more years for it to get in production. We run Colby variety. Colby's an old one around. It's uh, it gets scab, um, but it's uh, it's a pretty good sized nut and 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 works well in our operation. Witty Witty's a nice nut. Comes from the northern part. I think comes from Iowa. Uh, not for sure. Don't really remember, but uh, it's it's. Pretty nice producer. It's got a uh, different shaped tree, but it's got about the ugliest nut meat there is. So uh, we kind of mix a few in here and there. But uh, if anything I'd ever sell to a shell, it would definitely be the Witties. Niblix, uh, another my mother loved those. Uh, they crack in halves. They're pretty light color, a nice one with a little share, a little shy on bearing. Uh, we don't really have much scab problem with those. And we have Posey and Peruke and Hershey, uh, you know. Kind of minor varieties and stuff, but uh, they all have the good points and bad points of them all. But uh, have never really ever found that perfect pecan yet. Um, just as soon as the, the catkins come off the trees, uh, we'll start uh, our spray. I really don't like to spray, but when you've got as many pecan trees and stuff, we tend to have any kind of disease or insect. Uh, somebody asked me one time, you know, if I went organic and stuff, and I didn't spray as well, and I really probably wouldn't get lose about 70% of my crop, which really I can't afford to do that. But uh, we'll spray with a fungicide, and then uh, probably a little insecticide to take care of the pecan nut case bear, which can abort nuts. We have a big nut set this year. We may not spray for those and let insects uh, thin our trees, 
maybe five to ten percent. We yeah, we don't spray for those. Normally, wait about three weeks, and we'll spray another fungicide and put a little chemical in it too. But take care of the walnut caterpillars and, and that sort of thing. So uh, we work with that. Um, then uh, later on in the, in the thing, we'll do a sting bug and a weevil spray normally in, in August. Uh, we have Japanese beetles that hit us last year, kind of the first time we've ever had any of those, so it's a little different. Uh, don't really exactly know what to do with those yet, and we'll see what happens this year on that. Uh, some of the pros and cons on agroforestry, I think, you know, the income off that first establishment year is really great. I mean, on all those years before you get your, you know, before the orchard matures and stuff, and and back then, you know, the fertility and the chemicals were pretty well compatible. Um, if I was doing it again, I would probably go 60 feet on the uh, on the spacing. Uh, we could get some bigger equipment down through there, and they don't need to be in 40. And also, we would check them in both directions. That way, you can farm in both directions if you wanted to. Um, doing 200 acres at one time was really just a little too much. Uh, you know, when you got to plant 10,000 trees and graft. 10,000 trees and whatever on that sort of thing. It uh, it was just uh, just too much coming along at once. I'd probably do it like uh, 20 acres every year and in 10 years have my 200 acres. That way not everything's coming at once and, and just works a little better and stuff. Um, some of the cons, uh, you know, Roundup is hard on the cons. Uh, any major new crops of corn and soybeans are all Roundup ready per se. Um, kind of limits on spraying because you can't spray a young pecan tree and get any roundup on them or on the leaves and stuff. It uh, it may not kill them, but it sure messes them up and and kind of what I call a spider leaf on them. So you might as well pull or cut the tree down and plant a new one because it, it at eight years they still haven't come back out. We've had some damage in the years past. Dicamba is a new thing that's come out. Um, my renter will not spray dicamba, and I'm pretty proud of that, but hope my neighbors don't too. I think if anything's ever going to put me out of the pecan business, we'll probably be dicamba and, and it's a 2,4-D sort of thing. And we'll, we'll move at night and stuff. We're kind of worried about that. Um, some of the, you know, <clears throat> so that kind of let me show maybe some of the crops you could you could, could grow out there. Uh, special crops, you know, uh, you know, we could raise sweet corn out there, I guess, and you know, before it matures, but after those mature and you need to start picking up nuts, there's really not a whole lot you can raise out there because in my part of the country, you really can't pick uh, pecans up on dirt because of the rain and the fall in the mud and, and then the ground a little wet, harvest them on grass, but you can't harvest them on, on dirt very easy. Um, probably what I've seen is, is, is probably the main problem is I've got a lot of friends in the pecan business and stuff and neighbors and stuff and and they they plant too many pecans to be a hobby after a while. It's it's fun, but then they they have too many trees, but not enough. It's too much for a hobby, but not enough for a full time business where they can afford the equipment, the harvesters, the shakers, and all that kind of stuff. So you know, to make a living on it, you know, you you need to have it. It's kind of size to scale. I'm I'm sorry to say, I think uh, we shoot for about a thousand pounds of nuts to the acre. Some years we weigh over that. Some years we're a little under that, depending on the weather and and top of year and stuff like that. last year we had a hailstorm that pretty well wiped me out but uh out of 45 years on the farm that's the first hailstorm we've ever had now we normally get about 250 to three dollars a pound for our nuts uh, after we process them and stuff we run about a thousand dollars expenses a year on per per acre on those and that includes land cost fertilizer uh harvesting expense labor Processing, you know, everything, it pretty well figures out to about a thousand dollars an acre. So, we're looking at income for about fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars pretty well income off those off those trees. Um, be true of you, some years I would have made a lot more money if I would have sold them to shellers. Uh, but I like to have, uh, you know, a ready market of thousand people come and get macon from me than than just sell them to one or two people. And then when somebody have, when Georgia and Texas and everybody has a tremendous crop. Uh, those shellers are probably not wanting to come up to Missouri and buy pecan, so uh, we try and keep all that going. So um, that's it, pretty well on my end. Um, just if you have some people that might want to ask a question or so, or you have any questions, we can kind of go from there. I had a question, Dan, about um, how you process the nuts. So it sounds like you spray the nuts um, with insecticide so you don't get any 
nut weevils or anything, but do you do you ever have issues where you've got to boil the nuts or do something else? What happens when we when we uh, when we harvest them and stuff? Of course, they're dumped in the wagon. Well, they they're circling the ground, picked up off the ground, and then uh, we bring them up to the uh, pecan building out back where we have. Uh, the cleaners and stuff that uh, go through and and pull off the light and pecans and any leaves and sticks and stuff that come out that's picked up. Uh, then also they they go through a, a another thing that um, that takes a, a an eye sort of sort of thing that takes a picture of every nut that goes through the line and if it doesn't match the size, color, or texture, it gives it a shot air and blows that off and uh, blows that piece out. Whether it be a you know, a, a piece of deer bone, uh, you know, a pin oak acorn that, uh, you know, the crows brought in or something, or, or a bad pecan and one with the steel holes and stuff on it. They're coming in, they're putting bins uh, in dried, and then from there we bring them to the back of the store here where we have our processing, and from there they're washed uh, in water solution, and then they're dumped into a uh, chlorine bath where um, they're in there for about a couple of minutes, and it's uh, about a thousand parts per million, whereas the water you drink is about two parts per million. So it's pretty stout chlorine solution that, that pretty well takes care of anything that's on the outside of the nut itself. On, and then from there, we, we dry those and process them. So that's how that's done. Oh, interesting. That sounds, um, sounds like a lot. <laughs> uh, did you yeah, we go ahead and you know, crack them and you know, and then and 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 remove most of the shells and sell them that way, or we go ahead and completely shut them completely out and then sell the nut meats also. And a lot of people come directly to your farm. To sure. Yeah, yeah. We sell a lot. Uh, you know, right out of the store here, we have a store that's open three months out of the year, and we sell the jams and jellies and that kind of stuff, and and pecans and. Black walnuts and and whatever else we buy those that stuff in some candies and that stuff, uh, so uh, that worked uh, uh, that, that works well for us. Then we also have a few places. Uh, some of these bulk food stores have, have become a pretty good market for us, where they uh, they take our pecans and and uh, and sell them that way also, or or we have people that uh, really come and buy from us and go peddle them themselves out. So that's what happens. Yeah, oh, interesting. Um, Richard's got a question um, here. Do you use any irrigation to start young trees um, or during the dry years? Uh, that's a problem. You know, I'm in the river bottoms here, but we have no groundwater. We have no irrigation water where I am. I'm not where I could put a sand point down like in the Missouri River bottoms and stuff. I'm, I'm up a little farther than that, so we don't have any irrigation water here so we don't irrigate. That's why we plant the nut instead of a, a, a bare root tree or, or thing because uh, if it gets a dry year, uh, the nut, it'll go ahead and sprout and grows right on and we have a, you know, and, and the drought doesn't affect it. Uh, if we put a bare root tree or a container tree out there and it turns off dry, we have to water it and, you know, if you got eight or ten trees, it's not that big a deal, but when you got, you know, a thousand out there, it's uh, you know it's almost impossible to go ahead and get those to do that. So that's why we plant the nut instead of the uh, bare root tree. Um, I wish we had irrigation. I really do, but uh, uh, unfortunately I don't have that, so I have to uh, uh, do it the other way. We plant a nut anyway compared to a, a regular tree. We uh, in five years they'll be exactly the same. Uh, the bare root tree really won't grow for a couple of three years anyway to stay the same. And that other one we plant the nut at the same time will. We'll catch up with it normally within five years. You know, you really couldn't tell which one would be a bare root or a container tree compared to planting the nut. So that's that's it. And are you still expanding your operation there? Are you still planting a bunch more trees? <laughs> oh, yes and no. Um, I keep thinking about. Uh, uh, <clears throat> What we would, you know, I keep thinking, yeah, well, there, boy, there's about 15 acres, 10 acres down here that, man, it's a really good piece of ground. I don't really plant those in pecans because I think I could get those up in production in about in about 15 years and, you know, really be good. But I'm 62 years old now. I uh, really don't have anybody to, to I don't have any, we don't have, my wife and I don't have any kids, so we don't really have anybody to give the farm to to take over. So 
Uh, we probably got enough right now that uh, uh, probably don't. The last work we planted was about six years ago. So, and uh, like I say, we've been grafting on trees today. So, uh, on those sort of things, we're uh, we're hoping that uh, that'll probably be it. Yeah, three hundred acres of production. That's a pretty good. That's a pretty nice size pecan farm. That's a pretty big pecan farm. <laughs> um, so Rachel's asking, do you use uh, door nuts for planting, or do you order them? Um, no, I use my nuts. Uh, matter of fact, I sell a lot of nuts to people to plant. Um, you know, we use uh, a lot of different uh, varieties. We use Kanza for, for, for rootstock. We also use the Shepherd for rootstock, which that works out real well. Um, those two done it. I have used Pose, or I mean, uh, Pawnee for rootstocks also. Uh, uh, so we don't, uh, we don't really worry too much about that. Uh, um, you know, it's easy for me to raise my own on that. We also raise our own sign wood that we do the grafting with and everything. We have certain trees that we uh, dehorn per se to raise our own sign wood and everything else. So yeah, we uh, I've got the nuts. We we supply them. Like I say, I supply a lot of nuts. I ship a lot of nuts to to Korea, believe it or not, and in uh, places for for planting. So yeah. Um. Richard's asking, are there any food handling issues that are particularly problematic? And do you know of any new requirements that are coming down? Uh, not really. I tell you what, I have a real good friend of mine that's in the health department, uh, in charge of the health department in the county. And, and uh, uh, just, uh, you know, he keeps up on that for me. And, and really, because have been, for some reason, have been, and all the new regulations come out, they consider that they're all cooked and they really don't have the uh what i want to say uh, all the stuff that has to be done to them like other nuts and stuff do so and also i'm small enough still that you know i wouldn't qualify in as a huge processor yet so uh i'm still on the radar there uh, you know i like to sell a quality product and i have to you know i'm i'm something if i sell something bad you know i'm I'm liable for that, so I definitely don't want anything. If I won't eat it, I won't send it out the door. So it's pretty important. So uh, one of those things. No, to, no we don't really have uh, have too much health problems with them. And they're pretty well protected. Like I say, I've been inspected before, and I sat in it, and everybody seems to be happy with what I'm doing. So uh, I don't rock the boat. Right. Um, Rachel's asking. Could you operate without spraying, or would the quality be too poor for the market? Could I operate without spraying? No. Um, believe me, if I could, I would not spray. I mean, it's uh, it's expensive. You know, I just bought a brand new sprayer this year, eighty some odd thousand dollars for a pecan sprayer. But I had to have it. If I don't, I'm not going to raise a crop. Like I say, if I didn't spray, I'd, if I raised a 30% crop, I'd be lucky, and the quality would really be be bad. Most people probably wouldn't want to buy them. Uh, I wouldn't want to sell them, especially because you have to spray for the scab and stuff. Now, insect damage, uh, sting bugs have really become a big problem for us. Uh, you know, they can they can ruin 10, 15% of the nuts. They put a black spot on them, and those have gotten to be a, be quite a bit of problem for us, and we don't spray for those. We, you know, I mean, it, the quality of our product goes way, way down. And if we were selling to a shelter, all those would be coming out. Well, you know, we wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't be very good. We do, they would be kicking, you know, just on stink bugs, 10 to 15 percent of the nuts out that they wouldn't even be buying. So, you know, yeah, it, it, it adds. Uh, you know, we, uh, you know, I, I do all the spraying myself, and I do it at night. I normally start about eight, nine o'clock at night and spray till about eight, nine in the morning. And, it takes me quite a bit to do that, so um, so anyway, uh, that's what uh, that's what we. Uh, sorry about that, but um, that uh, yeah, we uh, we have spray. <laughs> yeah, sure do. Um, and how many years from nut planting to nut harvesting? She, she said, sorry if you've mentioned this already. No, um, it varies on, 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 on the, somewhat on the type of ground we're putting them on, on some really good ground. We can get some start production. On about 10 years, we'll start getting maybe a few nuts if we graft. You have to graft. If you don't graft, you know, you're going to get a long, long time. So uh, it's, uh, it's really, you know, beside the point on that. If 
we normally we consider we get uh, production at about 15 years. Harf, you know, hard production definitely at 20, and full production at 25 years. Whereas it's about twice as long as any place else because of the, you know, our growing season so short here, and we don't have the heat units. So yeah, it takes about 20, 20 years to really start getting any decent, really good return off of them, and and uh, 25 for full full return. A long time. <laughs> yeah. Um, the old saying, you know, only old men plant trees, and, and, and I have to say that that's really not true because I sure planted a lot of trees when I was young, but I had an old man out there making me plant them, and I'm kind of glad he made me made me do that. Yeah. Um, do you – does um, a lot of your income come from the pecans, or um, I guess what percentage? Well, we have – we have about, like I say, 3,000 acres of row crop on the farm, and uh, and I, I don't farm it. Um, it's it's a situation that I'm too big to be a small farmer and too small to be a big farmer. So I have a renter that that rents out and I rent out my ground and, and uh, on a share basis, and and normally, um, you know, that that'll bring in just about as much as the pecans, or maybe just a little more. So oh, okay. yeah, I mean, the pecan is is a big part of my. Uh, my income, I'll be truthful with you, um, the farm's paid for, everything's paid for, uh, so it makes uh, makes life a little, quite a bit easier. You know, for a lot of years back in the 80s and, and uh, 90s, especially in the 80s, we suffered hard with high interest rates and, and low farm prices like everybody else did. And, and it was kind of tough, you know, planting pecan trees in there and then, you know, taking that out. But uh, we knew someday it'd come down the road and stuff. Uh, so it... Uh, yeah, it uh, it's it's a it's a major part of our income. It sure is here on the farm. And how did you start marketing? Um, how did you build up a customer base when you when you started? Um, when we had the buffalo on the farm, um, we sold buffalo meat along, and we had the store open, you know, uh, year round. Uh, it worked out real well, and we sold pecans mainly in the fall and stuff. And we kind of did what everybody else did. We kind of did what we call crack pecans and stuff. But in this part of the country, everybody has native, and very few of them are grafted. Where our orchard's pretty well all grafted. We have the nicer sized pecans. And then we went through a deal where we <coughs> um, did, we put all these air crackers in, spent the money and bought air crackers, and we do a lot better job of cracking these pecans. And then. We learned out that hey, people, you know, would just crack the pecans and put them in a sack, in a paper sack, and and that was fine. But you know, you 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 know, natives, you're running 40 percent pecan nut meats and 60 percent shells. Well, people didn't, you know, they'd throw the shells away, so it didn't look very good. So we we ran those uh, pecans when we crack them through an air separator and take most of the shell out. So mainly, what people get just a few big pieces of shell and pecans and. Put them in a three-pound bag and 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 sell them that way, and it's it's really uh, improved our marketing, and and that's really made uh, you know really improved our sales tremendously. Yeah. Um, we got out of the buffalo business, uh, so instead of open having store open 12 months out of the year for selling buffalo meat, we just opened in the fall for pecans. We were also very large in the eastern gamma grass business, which was one of the native warm season prairie grasses. And we were the largest supplier of eastern gamma grass in the country for nothing for years and years and years. Matter of fact, that took up about 80% of my time. I spent most of my time in the office, set with a headset on, uh, selling gamma grass seed and, and and answering questions about that. So while somebody had to be here to answer the phone to sell seed, it's just easy to keep the store open year-round to sell buffalo meat because it was uh, normally our busy time for that was January, February, March. That was the slowest time for the sales in the store, but we kept store open in to do all that. So uh, okay. that's it. It uh, it worked out real well, but now we're out of the buffalo business, we're out of the grass seed business, and just in the pecan business. And and uh, instead of working seven days a week, which the store was open seven days a week, uh, we now uh, can go and, and, and do a little traveling and and stuff uh, nine months out of the year that we could never do before all those years we, we my wife and I ran the farm so that's nice life is good <laughs> yeah um, what do you do with all the shells um, the shells and stuff we do and, and uh, the bad pecans and stuff we, we you know kicked out the, the that sort of stuff um, we scatter them around on the farm uh, 
we put them on, you know, the crop ground in the fall and stuff. We'll scatter them out on the crop ground or or, or pasture grounds and stuff like that. Uh, uh, I got a few of my buddies that like to take it and 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 they'll take them and 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 put them around some a few spots for for wildlife food because it'll have some nuts and some nut meats and stuff in them and the shells and stuff and uh-huh. all the turkeys and the coons and the possums and stuff like to scratch around in it and stuff. So. They kind of like to do that. They use it stuff, that sort of thing. Uh, we don't really sell them for uh, what I would say, um, you know, some people landscape them and that sort of stuff. But we have enough nut meats in there that, it, in, you know, it's a good way to to, uh, to invite rodents up next to your property and, and, and insects and that kind of stuff. So we oh, don't. Sure. Uh, so we we don't really do that, you know, with it. Uh, or some people, some big shutters, they strictly uh, shells, and they can use those things for other things that we can't do. I'm not a, I'm not a efficient as those guys that are shelling millions and millions of pounds a, a year, mm-hmm. but uh, we're uh, efficient enough to, to do what we can do, and we do a few small lots for a few other people, but uh, to shell, shell their becomes if they're grafted and stuff, <clears throat> and uh, kind of keeps them help busy year, you know, through the winter. Uh, and that's the main thing is staying busy in you know January and February March uh, we do that uh, shell arc stuff and normally that gives us uh, through January that gives us February March to go ahead and, and get everything cleaned up and serviced and put away for the winter and and you know all the mowers going over and this that and the other so uh, so if we mow all the time <laughs> it's a matter of main business and we mow the orchard about six times a year we keep it looking like a park you know uh, we learned a long time ago if you want to, uh, you know, be on a highway and highly visible, that that you need to keep things looking nice and and people expect it. if you you know you got a nice looking place uh, and people things are picked up and mowed up, uh, they feel better you know about, about buying product from you and stuff. And matter of fact, in my store we have a big picture window where you can look in the back where we're processing and cracking pecans and, and working on the pecans in the back back there. We don't want to we don't hide anything at all. It's right out in the open, and you know, if, uh, when we're cracking back there, the you know the nuts are flying and dust is flying everywhere. But you know, at the end of the day, you know, we do a big cleanup, and everything looks like you could eat off the floor back there. So, and people appreciate that, you know, where they can see where they're coming from. And I've had a lot of people say, "Well, we sure like to see this because what well, sure looks clean and nice back there, and you know, we we know we're getting a good product from you." So, yeah, uh, that's that, you know, sort of thing. We do a little spraying on the orchards that we probably wouldn't have to do to mainly take care of like. Ten caterpillar webworm. They don't really hurt anything, but they look bad. And oh. if you don't spray, those people think you don't take care of your orchard. Uh, one year we had the Easter freeze. There was no nuts in the orchard. And there was. I thought, well, I could save some money on that last couple of mowings, and we didn't mow the orchard. No need to. And uh, finally, uh, people started coming for pecans, and we had a few left over from the year before. I've got a large freezer we store stuff in, and I. You know, people say, well, gee, you're getting out of the pecan business. I said, what do you mean? Well, your orchard's not all mowed up and looking nice and pretty like a park. Well, yeah, but there's no pecans to pick up, and there's no reason to do that, you know, to spend all the money. Because it takes about, you know, two employees about a week to mow that orchard. And finally, after about the fourth person came by in about two days and told me that, uh, my employees came in that morning and said, all right, get the tractors out, hook the mowers back up, go over and mow the dang orchard, you know, because, we, you know, people expect it to be looking nice in the fall and it looks like a park, so we better do it. So, one of those things, that's what we have to do. Huh. Well, that's interesting. That's good to know, too. Yeah. Uh, like I say, I, if I didn't have to do it, I sure wouldn't do it. It's, it's expensive, but uh, uh, people can't expect everything to be looking nice and mowed up. And if it's not, they think, well, something must be wrong. Right. How? So I think you might have said this at the beginning, but how many people do you have working on the pecan part? Well, my wife, she runs a store. and. Okay. And, and does all the book work and all that kind of stuff and pays all the bills and, and, and that sort of thing. And, and she's also in charge of all the shipping because we do some Internet sales and phone sales and that stuff. But people aren't able to come out the farm anymore and they want our pecans. And we ship them, you know, all over the country. And uh, that's her job. My job is uh, 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 decide on, on when we're going to harvest, what we're going to harvest, and oversee it all. I do pretty well all the pecan tree shaking. I have one employee um, full time, and and he'll run a harvester. He runs a harvester in the fall, 
and then I have a fraternity brother of mine that uh, lives about 35 miles from me, and he likes to come down and run a harvester. Uh, so when we're harvesting, he'll come down and, and run a harvester for me. And then normally I hire one part-time gal uh, when we're cracking in the bag back here or cleaning um, to help in the bag back there. So uh, mainly uh, we can run a cracking area down there with about four people. We can process about 5,000 pounds of pecans in a day back there. We're doing a, a cracking and blowing pecans. So, uh, but that takes four of us, so we pull the... Okay, if if we're harvesting this that and the other, I'm gonna have to hire somebody else to come and help because me and my wife and two other gals could do it, or we'll pull my harvester man in and and we'll uh, with one extra person get it done. So okay. that's it. Just don't don't use a whole awful lot of help. It's uh, uh, we have a lot of equipment that, that that does a lot of the work for us, so helps out. Labor's pretty short in this part of the country. Right. Right. Somebody asked about grafting some trees, I think, I saw just pass by. Oh. Yeah, it looks like we have I didn't I didn't see that. Thanks. <laughs> do you uh Jared asked, do you graft onto all of your seedling trees? Um are the seeds seeds planted directly into the field? And if so, how do you protect the seeds planted in the field? Um we yes, we plant the seeds right in the field, and and we stratify them. We and what I do is I take the pecans that I'm going to plant in the in the fall and excuse me in the spring, uh, decide which ones varieties we're going to use, and and we take them and soak those in water for about uh, 24 hours, and I put them in some wet sawdust or sand or peat moss or something, and then uh, in buckets and with a lid on, and then uh, make sure they're good and damp, and and then throw them in a cooler. Let them sit in the cooler all winter, and that makes them think they're in the winter. Then uh, when we come to plant, we'll pull them out, and about the time they start sprouting, we'll take them straight to the field and plant them then. That way we don't have a lot of problems with animals digging them up. I've never had a problem with it before. I know some people have had that in their seedlings. Uh, you know, if we plant a Kansas, you know, it probably could come back somewhat like a Kansas, but probably could not, the same way with a shepherd, whatever. So yes, we graft them, and the reason we graft them is two reasons. Number one is we know exactly what we're going to get when we graft it, and number two is is that it gets to production a lot sooner. If we don't graft, we got to add it. Almost takes twice as long. So we're putting mature wood on a juvenile, and uh, and it goes off from there. The problem with that is is that we're putting you know uh, mature wood on to a tree. Juvenile wood tree likes to go straight up and down. You know, grow straight leader, straight up uh, mature wood. They want to grow like a fruit tree, everything else, and grow every which way. So it's a, it's always been a job of pruning to keep them growing in a straight leader, and in height and stuff. So, so more extra work, but you get them in production a lot sooner. Also, having them all grafted the same varieties when we harvest a row, we harvest. Okay, we're harvesting uh, cons of a day, and okay, well we're gonna harvest row seven and nine. You know, 22, 23, 24. Then we're going to jump up to row 58, 59, then over to row 72 and 73. But when we harvest, we want to harvest all those counts at once. And then when the whole row is, you know, the one variety, it works out great. And the reason for that is when we bring them back up here to the cleaner, we can set the cleaners and stuff to clean just that variety. Whereas if it was a different variety, which may be a little lighter, a little heavier, a little bigger, a little smaller, a little darker, especially the, the sorting machine up there that takes a picture of every nut that they run through 5,000 pounds an hour, but it's, uh, you know, that's 50,000 nuts that's taking a picture of an hour. Um, but, you know, it knows just to look for that one variety, and anything else that is not that variety, it would tend to kick out. So uh, that's nice to have in everything, the varieties. Then when we, we bring them back here to process them, the crackers are set, uh, you know, if we're cracking a Pawnee, which is a big old thin shell nut, or a Colby, which is a really hard shell nut, you know, it's the, the cracker is set for the Colby. It's going to smash the Pawnee, and and that sort of thing. So we we you know we got five crackers back there, air crackers, and each one could can crack a different one. And when we mix it in the blown, we can you know get a nice mix through there. I hope that kind of answers the question on what we graft and why we graft. But yeah, yes, we do graft. And matter of fact, we started grafting yesterday. Um, 
the employee it's his first year of grafting, but today we got along a lot better. We're averaging about oh, 14 trees an hour. So, uh, you know, when we, we team graft, uh, uh, it goes a lot faster when you got two guys working on one tree instead of, you know, each person in a tree. Maybe you could get more done, a little more done, but it, time seems to go a lot faster when you got somebody to talk to and, and hand stuff and this, that, and the other, too. So it works out a little better for us that way. So, any other questions? If there's no other questions. So I'd like to, to thank you again, Dan. Um, this is such great information. I really appreciate all the time that you took to share um, all your experiences with us. Um, and, and thank you again to everybody for joining us tonight. Um, I'm so, so glad that you could join us, and I hope everybody has a great night. Okay, well, thank you everybody for listening. I, uh, I hope I answered a few questions for you or whatever. It's, uh, you know, we do things a little different here maybe than, 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 than some places, but uh, uh, it's been working for us, so we can't complain. Yeah, yeah, that's, this, is, this is all great information. Um, and, your, and your orchard, I, I have to say that it does look great. <laughs> all, all that hard work and, and money that you spend, I mean, the pictures, they just really look great. Thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, you know, there's a lot of labor. There's a lot of stuff. People think you just plant a pecan tree and just go out and pick nuts up, and there's a lot more to it than that. There's something to do year-round with them. So, uh, But uh, nothing more than I like to do than, than drive around the orchard after work and in the evening, and my wife, after about a half hour, she said, you ready to go back and eat supper, you know? <laughs> I need to look at a few more places, and then we'll go from there, so. <laughs> well, that sounds great. <laughs> so, anyway. Yeah, life is good, and we're, we're having a good time, so that's nice. Anyway, but uh, appreciate everybody that, uh, that stayed in and listened.